Uh, yeah, it's very often that. That's right. So I'd like to welcome everybody to the first CS program. seminar uh, this year. I'm so happy to hear to everybody. Uh, we kick off the year with uh, Shiram Banda Harizada, spelled like it sounds, uh, from USC. Uh, I've known Shiram for quite a long time. I'm really happy to have him here. Um, I was on his PhD committee uh, in 1990 at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, he's been doing all sorts of interesting big data ish things ever since, uh, basically, various parallel ways of dealing with this uh, video, audio, uh, data, etc. cetera, uh, has several awards that are uh, worth noting here. Uh, one is the NSF Young Investigator Award early in his career. Uh, another is the USC School of Engineering Research Award. Uh, and last, but by no means least, uh, he is one of the co recipients of the ACM Software Systems Award, which is uh, sort of a, a a global award given by ACM for software work. Uh, he was part of one of the most significant parallel database projects that I did, uh, called Gamma. So if you're in databases, you probably know about Gamma. If you're in databases, you don't know about Gamma, so don't read about it, it's important. Uh, but anyway, Sean has written a copy of this data, uh, which is, I guess, theoretically related to something we've done before, but for me, it sounds like totally fine. But, so I want to hear about it, but welcome. Yeah, thank you, Mike. So thanks, thanks for having me, and thank you, Mike, for the kind introduction. So yes, my name is Shahan Al-Hanta Farizadeh, and I want to tell you about some of the research that you see in Make uh, It's on intelligent treatment of immediate delays uh, using blind light steps. I've been working on this topic for three years, uh, but as Mike just mentioned, uh, the roots of this research go back to 1990s, but I was working on a video on demand server. And uh, I want to bore you with that history because I know I'm standing between you and lunch. So let's just focus on this intelligent 3D multimedia displays and take it up. So here's the outline of the talk. I want to start by telling you about blind light, light specs. And then subsequently, I want to introduce an abstract architecture and tell you about an instance of that architecture, which is drone vision. And based on the drone vision, I want to tell you how we support static and motion illuminations and conclude by telling you about our future of drone, which is excellence. So flying light spec, you know, it's, it's a drone. It's a miniature sort of size drone that is configured with a red, green, blue light sources uh, they adjust the both brightness. Drones are a lot of fun. How many of you have played around with drones? Yeah, they are super cool, and I'm sure you've noticed they're getting smaller and smaller as they go. Uh, the drones that we are talking about here, in addition to the light sources, they uh, have a central processing unit, a CPU, to run programmable, and uh, they also the illuminations. Uh, an illumination is realized using one or more swarms, and uh, these swarms may consist of uh, millions, if not billions, of these analysis. So think of this thing as Amazon's data center. You have many computers shrunk down to a very small area where they are communicating and working and with one another. Uh, drones, as you know, have physical presence. You can touch them. And if I have millions and billions of them grouped together, they are almost like a 3D printer. They materialize these virtual objects that uh, are illuminated. So over here, you are seeing an illumination of the bricks of the game Jenga. And uh, when the user presses on one of the blocks, uh, the drones fly back against the user's touch uh, to provide uh, half interaction consistent with the surface friction 
of the blocks of the yeah. group adjacent <laughs> and below the block that the user is talking about. So uh, the user can have haptic interactions with their bare hands, uh, no need for any glove or a body suit to interact with this 3D interaction. So let me tell you about a system architecture and an instance of that architecture. So here's an abstract architecture. At the very top, that black uh, conveyor belt is a garbage collector. That balances are mechanical devices that will fail. And when they fail, they fall on top of this conveyor uh, belt. And the conveyor belt deposits them into the terminus, which are at the two ends of this step. So the conveyor belt is just rotating like this. Below it are the hangers where the FLSs are housed. And these FLSs we are assuming are fabric fiber. So there are charging stations uh, that are set aside to charge these FLSs. And FLSs can fly into those orange cylinders on the side to gain access to the charging stations. And then they're dispatched from the yellow cylinders that dispatches them uh, for elongated three dimensional shapes. That's an abstract architecture. A more uh, realistic architecture is the drone vision and the DD uh, that we ignore here. So, what you're looking at is essentially uh, an Intel RealSense depth camera. So today, as I speak, depth cameras do exist and they can generate sequence of point clouds. So it's recording a real rose with a falling pebble and those point clouds are fed into this drone vision that's illuminating uh, that real rose within the fixed wall. As you can see, there's a conveyor belt uh, underneath and uh, the wireless charging coils are at the top. And below the conveyor belt are these uh, black panels that have the FLSs. And there is a stack of them below every white panel. So they can be elevated using an arm. And essentially, these FLSs fly beneath the conveyor belt, the garbage collector, to gain access to the display volume to illuminate the shape that is shown here. And this is full motion, so it will have full motion with the rose pedal falling uh, from the uh, front of the clock. So let me start to fill in the details. Uh, as an FLS, which is a drone, has an area of instability below it that's referred to as downrange. So another FLS entering that region. Uh, will become unstable. Its flight will be inhibited because of the flight of that drone. So uh, we take the display volume and we break it into display cells. Each display cell corresponds to the FLS and its downwash area. And at any instance in time, only one FLS may occupy a display cell. This FLS can illuminate an illumination cell. So over here, the illumination cell is represented as a cube consisting of uh, 27 display cells, three by three by three. So 27 display cells. And here the FLS is shown as illuminating the entire illumination cell. But in practice, it should be able to illuminate an arbitrary phase of this cube. So that's the point. And then the other part of the design is that the FLS should be invisible. So when it lights up one of these illumination cells, it should not be visible to the human eye. The human eye should not notice it so that it can provide the illusion of the shapes that it is uh, illumined. To keep the user safe, uh, the drone vision has glass panes around it. So on the four sides, there are four glass panes. And it prevents rogue FLSs from flying into the user's eyes, the user's nose, or the user's ears, uh, that who is standing <clears> all over there. And then, as you can see, at the very top, there is a wireless charging coil where the, these battery powered FLSs fly through in order to gain access to the charging coils to charge themselves. 
these charging cords are a lot like what you see at Starbucks, where you put your device on and it gets charged. So that's what's being depicted here. Of course, you could have far more sophisticated technology, such as charging using laser. So using light uh, has been shown as a mechanism to charge batteries. And that could easily be applied to here as well. So at the end of the day, when you look at an illumination, there's that rose that's shown over there. It consists of 65,000 FLSs. And you can think of each FLS as today's server with rotors attached to it. First of all, it's miniaturized. Second, it has rotors attached to it so that it can fly. So it looks like uh, a data center today. So today's data centers, I'm sure you've heard in your database course or in your systems course, that failures are the norm rather than an exception. And the same applies here. Uh, these FLSs yeah. that are illuminating that rose will be failing on a continuous basis. So the uh, conveyor belt is supposed to catch those falling, failing FLSs that fall on the conveyor belt. And as you can see in front of it, there is an empty area, a garbage collection area for those failed FLSs to be deposited into. So the conveyor yeah. belt rotates and deposits the failed FS, FLSs into those terminus. And then FLSs, functioning FLSs fly from under, underneath. And every time they fly, the uh, conveyor belt stops for the FLSs to fly around it uh, in order to gain access to the display area. <clears throat> so uh, to uh, handle these uh, failures, uh, we construct reliability groups with standby FLSs. So the idea is to have uh, these FLSs that are dark. They are just deployed out there and they're waiting for these illuminating FLSs to fail. And every time an illuminating FLS fails, these uh, standbys, a dark standby, substitutes for its location and lights up in order to illuminate that point that has just gone dark. During normal mode of operation, these standby FLSs try to stay out of uh, the user's field of view. So we have a paper here uh, with Bob in the audience. I don't see Bob. There is Bob, so he can answer all the questions regarding failure handling. But essentially, uh, what we are doing is we are tracking the human gaze and uh, that information is broadcasted to the FLSs, and the FLSs use their local processing to detect that they are obstructing uh, an illumination cell, and they pretty much relocate in order to hide themselves behind an illuminating uh, FLS. So that's the basic idea here. An alternative to this is for that dark obstructing standby FLS to start to illuminate the light of the illuminating cell Below it, behind uh, that is obstructing. So that's yet another approach to handle the obstruction. Would it be the same cell? Same. So it moves into the illumination cell, but a different display cell. So over here, the illumination cell consists of twenty-seven display cells, and it's moving to one below, uh, so that it's not impacted uh, by the downwash of that uh, illumination. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to interrupt by the way. So and if it is transparent, then we don't need to be worrying about the user's line of sight. Exactly. So if uh, the, uh, the the standby FLS can illuminate the light uh, that it is obstructing, perhaps it can become invisible. And in that case, it doesn't need to move elsewhere. Just to uh, put things into perspective, in the paper that we did, we realized that the distance it's moving is not much. And the reason why is because when you construct reliability groups, say with uh, three FLSs and one standby, you try to put the standby uh, in the center close to those three uh, illuminating FLSs that it is trying to substitute for. For it to hide itself is to move into one of those illumination cells, and that distance isn't much because it's already on the other side. So uh, the distance is not that great. But the benefit uh, of it is huge 
So what you every time an FLS fails, uh, a point in uh, the point cloud goes down. That's what it means because an FLS is eliminating a point of uh, the point cloud. So the question is, go ahead, Dan. So if the standby or the redundant one is sitting on a cell close by, and it's illuminating from there, or is moving into the space of the cell that's in, or the FLS that's in? Good question. So the standby is always dark. It's not illuminating any light. Right. And when it detects that it's obstructing, it moves uh, into the illumination cell of uh, one of the uh, illuminating FLSs that is a standby. Okay. So it does move. So it doesn't. Yeah. It could have just become undark yes. from where it is, and that's that would other. be a slightly different technique. way of technique. Right? That's right. That's definitely a possibility. Exactly. The idea is going to illuminate a different, the same light as the illumination. That means there are same number of standbys as the number of illuminating FLS. No. So we can control that. So with group size of three. Uh, there are three illuminating FLSs and one standby. With group size of 20, there are 20 illuminating FLSs and one standby. So all of that is configurable. And uh, mm -hmm. essentially what you're seeing here is the mean time to <coughs> illuminate the dark point. And every time a point go, uh, every time an FLS fails, the point goes dark. How long does it take to restore that point? If there are no standbys, we are looking at approximately half a second. Uh, with uh, group sizes of 20, it's reduced to less than 0.2 seconds. And with group size of 3, it's less than 100 milliseconds. So that's the basic. Uh, in this model, is the human eye fixed, or are we having multiple points where that we have to consider like every single obstruction angle? Every single every obstruction. Single, okay. And the it's user, monitoring each one of the, yeah. The user is mobile. Got and what's very interesting about your question, and it's discussed in the paper, is that imagine a scenario where I have an illumination and the user is moving around it. So mm -hmm. as the user moves around it, these uh, standbys hide themselves. But once they detect they are no longer obstructing, they move to their optimal position mm -hmm. in order to implement this MTID. So there is movement back and forth uh, to optimize how quickly they can move. Super challenging for one, but can you both look? Like, can yes. you have multiple users? Yes, absolutely. That's uh, that's also discussed in the paper. It's more complex, but it's definitely <coughs> that's right. <coughs> so uh, these FNSs are, uh, we assume that they are powered by a battery. And uh, STAG is an algorithm that manages the battery of a swarm of FNSs not individual FLSs. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it charges uh, FLS batteries as a function of time to minimize both the number of charging stations and the overall number of FLSs required to render an illumination. The stack, this algorithm assumes each FLS has a fixed lifetime that's shown at the top row and that uh, on a fully charged battery and that there is a time to charge uh, the batteries. The first column that you're looking at are these nano uh, wiper uh, drones that you can buy at Target for $22. So they're very inexpensive. And as you can see, the flight time on a fully charged battery is five minutes, and it requires approximately 10 minutes uh, to charge itself. So, uh, the reason this is important is because the ratio dictates the overhead required, the number of extra FLSs required to render an illumination. So with those numbers, uh, that rows that requires 65,000 FLSs requires twice as many FLSs to uh, just maintain a continuous illumination where uh, FLSs are continuously charging are flying back and forth from the illumination to the charging station to, uh, to maintain the illumination that is shown. The green box that you're seeing over there highlights the number of FLSs that are in transit at any point in time 
from the charging stations to the illumination. So with the characteristics of today's batteries, uh, some like 220 FLSs are moving back and forth from the charging stations at the top and the illumination <coughs> that you're seeing at the bottom. And of course, all of those guys need to hide themselves so they cannot obstruct the user's point of view. And some of that is described in that ACM multimedia paper that appeared in 2022. <coughs> what is the size of this rose roughly? The size of it? Yeah. It's, uh, it's adjustable, that's the short answer. No, but, but is it like a bust size or is it like a, what I'm trying to get at is with 65,000, how big a display are you able to make? Yeah. So something that I skimmed through is the ratio of the illumination cell to the display cell. So when you increase the ratio of the illumination cell to the display cell, the size of the rows grows and shrinks. And, uh, but you know, ultimately this rows that you're looking at has a fixed size uh, that is a, I don't remember it to be able to tell you exact, exactly. Uh, but just remember that the size of the illumination cell relative to the display cell impacts its size. And so we view this uh, drone vision uh, to be modular and configurable. So once the user has programmed it and the illumination is stable, meaning that there are no more rogue FLS is flying around <clears throat> to people's eyes and nose and ears, the user may remove the panels from around the drone vision, take the top and put it on the side of it. Now the charging coils are behind it, and then more importantly, the illumination can extend beyond the size of the base of that uh, charge. Uh, in fact, the user may be able to define that area outside of the drone vision. And now the illuminations, so here, for example, the user has specified a tabletop, so the illuminations will extend beyond the base onto the tabletop, so such that the renderings are illuminated there. So let me tell you a little bit about the static illuminations. So to illuminate shapes and provide haptic interactions, this drone vision requires a localization technique. We cannot use GPS because this thing is indoors. And when you're using it indoors, it doesn't have line of sight with GPS satellites in order to be able to localize the drones. So we need a technique that is fast, should be highly accurate, it should be continuous because drones are known to drift. For those of you who have played around with the drones, you just fly and start to act like a drunk. Mm -hmm. It moves around in one direction. So we need to compensate for that. It has a it needs to have a fixed overhead, meaning that if I go from a million FLSs to a billion FLSs, uh, it shouldn't become extremely slow. That's not acceptable. So it should be, have a fixed overhead independent of the number of FLSs. It should be resilient to pa uh, network packet loss. Uh, we've experimented with crazy flies. And uh, we've noticed that they just drop a lot of network packets when they communicate. Uh, it should be resilient to FLS failures, FLSs departing to charge their battery, and FLSs returning after having charged their battery. And again, we cannot use GPS. It's just not going to work because this drone vision is indoors. So uh, typically, a technique that is used out there is to use dead reckoning. So uh, drones have this inertial measurement unit, like a gyroscope and the accelerometer that <clears throat> enable it to approximate where it's going. Uh, these IMUs are, known, are notorious for being noisy. So they're not precise. And as, you, <clears throat> as the drone travels a farther distance, the margin of error uh, that it incurs becomes greater and greater. So, what you're seeing at the top in blue is the ground truth. So we want to illuminate that butterfly. It has some like 97 points. If you're counting those points, you can stop counting. It's 97 points. And uh, below you're seeing 
the estimated truth based on that reckoning where the dispatcher is at the origin. So FLSs are being deployed from zero, zero coordinate. And uh, you're looking at different amount of error, one degree, two degree, and five degrees of error. And if you notice the side of the butterfly uh, ring that is closest to the origin, it's more accurate than the uh, other ring of the butterfly. And the reason for that is very simple. The ring uh, that is more accurate is closer to the origin, zero, zero. And that reckoning travels, FLSs fly shorter distances, that's why it's more accurate. The ring that's farther away from the origin, zero, zero, FLSs have to fly longer distances, and as a result, the ring is more distorted. So, how do we measure the amount of distortion? Cost of distance is a technique uh, to quantify the distortion. Uh, host of distance essentially takes every point in the estimated truth, every point in the ground truth, and computes the difference in the number of displacements, and takes the maximum of that value and says, this is the error. So it looks at the <coughs> worst case error, and that's what's used for the host of distance. And what I'm showing you here is the host of distance based on the death reckoning. The host of distance that I'm showing you here is at the granularity of display cells, not illumination cells. And it's only one or two. It's very low. But notice how it challenges symmetrical lines, symmetrical curves. The tail, the bottom of that cat, is supposed to be a straight line. But a simple house of distance of two, maximum of two display cells, causes it to become so tilted. So just a matter of having points just shifting slightly causes this thing to become distorted. And that's what we want to avoid, obviously. So you may be thinking about triangulation and trinaturation. Those are the techniques that are used with the GPS in order to localize vehicles or these uh, <laughs> location devices. Uh, so very beginning, we thought, well, we're going, we're going to take those FLSs that are very confident in their position those that are closest to the uh, origin. And we're going to use them as the basis to implement either triangulation and trilateration. And we spent a week on that, and we realized it's just terrible. <laughs> <laughs> the teapot there starts to look like a fish, and that was not too promising. The reason why it's, uh, it did so bad is because with the GPS, when you use triangulation and trilateration, the GPS satellites are precise. They are, they are facts. Here, with the uh, estimated truth having some error, if you try to leverage off of that, this error propagates and just <clears throat> results in mayhem. It just doesn't work. We tried in many ways to get this thing to work and gave up. It, it was just not happening. So, we were inspired by nature, and we decided to use the concept of swarms to localize the FLSs. The idea is that once two FLSs localize relative to one another, they become a swarm. From then on, they will move together. So they are locked together. <laughs> and when other FLSs are localized relative to them, or those FLSs localize relative to other FLSs, they become a bigger swarm. And they will all move together. They will not separate. Swarms form until the entire shape is one swarm. So then it calls itself, it goes back to the beginning as though there was no swarm and it repeats this process and it repeats it continuously. So as it repeats it, it becomes more and more accurate. And the reason it becomes more accurate is because it's repeating dead reckoning with shorter distances. And the shorter distances in dead reckoning are more accurate and that's why uh, this swarmer technique works. So, just a quick question. So, uh, earlier you had mentioned that underneath each of these specs, there is a space where there's motion, whatever. Uh, I don't know. Down wash. Down wash, right? Yes. So, do the uh, flight of these different specs interfere with each other at all? Uh, so my, my point is that if you're sort of 
the movement or the drift that you may have, is it random or what kind of drift? Is there a relationship between the drifts of two different things? Yes, and I'll, I'll come to that towards the end. I'll actually show you crazy flowers. I'll show you notes. Uh, and the fact that, you know, they can execute some of the things that I think. But then we come back to that towards the end of the talk where I will show you the actual notes. So my question is more about maintaining these swarms. So there is some communication that's happening? Yes, these uh, swarms are enabled uh, with, by a decentralized algorithm that's called Swarmer. It requires FLSs to communicate with one another. We have the concept of an anchor FLS and localizing FLS. And uh, each FLS maintains a swarm ID. And the FLS with the lowest swarm, uh, with the lowest ID, takes uh, the swarm ID. The swarm ID is propagated and it is used <coughs> in some occasions. There are many race conditions that happen. And we take care of the race conditions to make sure that uh, the algorithm executes successfully. What's the communication channel? What's the method? Yeah, so right now we are assuming the standard Wi-Fi, uh, but that will not work with 65,000. So uh, I welcome the participation of the networking <coughs> community to help us develop uh, new algorithms uh, for something like this. Zigbee is another alternative that we are considering today. But I think it's time to go back and if I have uh, a very small drone, smaller than one centimeter, how can I have communication within a range of two centimeters or two centimeters? And uh, the challenge there is the today's Wi-Fi technology, it considers it as noise <laughs> and just ignores it. So new protocols are required at a physical level to implement something like that. And in my opinion, that's an open uh, research topic that's on that. At, in the swarm level, you're assuming that there are no failing FLS. FLS. No, they are. They may fail. They may fail. They okay. may fail. And then it drops out of the swarm, basically. It drops out of the swarm. We use the concept of releases uh, to facilitate the successful execution of the algorithm. So very briefly, the anchor FLS grants a lease to the localizing FLS. Uh, if the, the localizing FLS wants to renew its lease periodically, and uh, essentially that the localizing FLS doesn't renew its lease, the anchor FLS will assume that the localizing FLS has failed <coughs> and unanchors it. It becomes free again to do whatever it wishes to do. So <coughs> all those protocols are in the paper and I'm not presenting that here, but that's an excellent question. So let's look at this uh, Swarmer algorithm. So here is a swarmer in action. And I hope you can see the swarms. So hopefully you can see that points start to move together. So at the beginning, there are uh, different points are moving. But then as swarms form, uh, essentially loops of points start to move together. And then they localize relative to one another in order to get um, I'm sure you noticed that the house broke this list of brothers. So by applying this swarmer algorithm, uh, the fast dog distance can become less than 0.1. And uh, this algorithm works for, so, so the way this algorithm works, and I already hinted at it, is that when I have a ground truth, there is this dispatcher that's deploying FLSs uh, from the origin, and you're looking at that reckoning, the, uh, five degrees of error. So the red is my estimated truth. And then there are two algorithms that we have, signal strength and physical movement to facilitate localization. So over here, uh, you will see an anchor appear. That's the uh, anchor FLS. The other one is the localizing FLS. It computes its relative position based on the estimated truth. So each FLS is told what its coordinate should be. <laughs> and based on its the truth that's given to it, it computes and it moves. With its physical movement, the localizing FLS moves next to the anchor <coughs> and then it moves to where it should be. Typically speaking, the distance moved by the signal strength is less than the distance moved by the physical movement. The reason why that's important is that with that reckoning, uh, 
uh, signal strength is more accurate than it is on the average because the amount of movement on the average by the FLSs is lower. I have a question. How do you prevent uh, the entire thing from just drifting and smushing into the glass? Do you have the ink, the root? That's an excellent question. What I'm showing you today has that limitation. Mm. So this, and you will see that, uh, mm. but here's the answer. The idea is to have one or two vertical FLSs mm. or to, with the drone vision, to have a few, one anchor. And that anchor would have the lowest ID and it would force everything. Uh, so the swarmer uses the idea of the FLSs to localize. So by assigning the lowest ID to that uh, to that oracle or to that point mm -hmm. that's fixated, this thing will not shift. Uh, I will show you 3D uh, uh, implementation of the swarmer. With the skateboard, you're going to notice the move. It suddenly moves. Uh, and the reason it's moving is exactly what you described. Swarms are moving, and they may actually move uh, a long distance. So let's look at that. Oh, before I do that, I think I did this one. So over here now, you're going to see the localizing and the anchor analysis. So that's how it works. Okay, so that's what you just saw. Uh, at any instance in time, more than two swarms may merge. So it's not as though only two swarms can merge. Once I have a swarm, uh, essentially other swarms can localize relative to it simultaneously. And then they will all merge to one. So that, that, that makes this algorithm very fast. So here it is now in 3D. <clears throat> you're looking at the blue dragon. Uh, that's my ground truth. And then you're looking at the purple dragon. That's my estimated truth. If you look at the very beginning, it's going to go really fast. So when you look at the, and it's in real time. So the real time is shown, the elapsed time is shown at the very top, and the hostile distance is shown below it. At the very beginning, you're going to see a fuzzy purple dragon. And then it starts to move, shiver, and it starts to become in focus. And then it stops. The reason it will stop is because it has formed one swan. Then it tells itself and starts to shiver again and shake, and then it stops and then it repeats. Once the hostile distance it drops below 0.1, we won't be able to see any movement because the distance they're moving is very small. And that's why we won't be able to see. So let's watch this. Notice that the dragon is fuzzy at the beginning. It freezes. So within tens of seconds, uh, it's doing a great job with the household distance. <laughs> and then beyond this, you don't see any movement. So even though this is in simulation, it has uh, the, uh, the velocity model, the acceleration, deceleration. All of that has been modeled uh, into this simulation features. The dragon is static. Yeah, the, the ground truth is provided. That's static, the, but the, uh, the ground truth was actually more as well. I'm going to show that in a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is static. We also have it for motion data collections. So with the static, of course, we can support uh, different shapes. So this is a 3D hand. Again, at the beginning, it looks really fuzzy because of the dead reckoning, but then it starts to localize relative to one another. And notice again, within a few seconds, it starts to look really good. And once the hostile distance is below 0.1, you won't see any movements. So uh, drones within a swarm, do they have any lag amongst each other? Is that, or they sort of move in unison? Like... They move in unison. So they compute a vector, and the localizing FLS broadcasts that vector to the FLSs in the swarm. And then all the FLSs in that swarm all move along that vector. So, so it looks like the, these these FLSs are moving, and then if something fails, the standbys are also moving, right? Yeah. So how do you avoid collision? Yes, excellent question. So uh, what about collision? Collision avoidance, collision prevention. 
The short answer is that we looked at this and we are not seeing collisions. <laughs> and the reason I, I think we are not seeing collisions is because of the symmetry of the shape. The shape is symmetrical. It's not arbitrary. Anyway, the number of collisions that we can detect with these shapes, given the state group that is here, is only four or five collisions. So, and that has been very interesting find for us. Uh, the place where we see a lot of collisions is with the drone vision when the FLS is trying to fly through that opening to gain access to the wireless charging station. That's where we see a lot of collision. The other place we see a lot of collisions is when you shut down the whole illumination and all FLSs want to come back home. So once again, we see a lot of collisions. But for this swarmer, <clears throat> and even changing from one shape to another shape, we don't see that many collisions. Is, uh, very interesting. Yeah, it's very interesting. So uh, we don't want to solve a problem that doesn't exist. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> I understood that. Right that. <laughs> so we are not getting into uh, like that. No, you're right. Maybe it's down the road, road it will become much smaller. Is that does that have any bearing with the ratio of the illumination cells in the display Yes, the Q, which is the ratio of the illumination cell to the display cell, matters. Even with a ratio of one to one the number of collisions is very few. Mm -hmm. If I increase the ratio to say three or 10, it goes away altogether. <laughs> no more okay. collisions. That makes sense. So uh, basic fundamental question, <laughs> suppose, suppose there is a failure and then it falls down, is that what the assumption is? And then what happens to that collision, so-called collision with other, uh, these FLS? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Right now we are assuming that when an FLS fails, it's because of its mechanical rotors that it's failing, that it can still communicate. And the idea for it is to broadcast, I'm failing, I'm failing, mm -hmm. and for other analysis to get out of it. So this thing starts to drop, these guys start to augment a bit uh, to give the sky to move away. So, now, uh, if you take the communication out of it, you're absolutely right. We need to think of better solutions to take care of. Uh, what, what will it do? Will it wipe out an yeah. entire column. column of things? Or will it go crazy? As you know, drones, when they fail, they may go completely crazy and just go unpredictable. And uh, yeah, we would have, uh, right now we're not there yet. And that's something that we, we need to think about. So I believe that the communication that you're talking about, right, because others are like kind of moving away to let it fall, it kind of accounts a little bit for the collision, right? Because everybody has kind of their other person's information.
the sequence consists of 115 point clouds, mm -hmm. and the display rate is 24 point clouds per second. <coughs> and each point cloud consists of approximately 65,000 points or FLSs. So we have an algorithm called Motil. And this algorithm computes FLS flight paths that transition one point cloud to the next. And the way it's doing it is using uh, by uh, dividing and conquering problem. It constructs a 3D grid on each point cloud and it processes the same cuboid from a pair of point clouds in order to compute the flight paths of the FLS to transition from one point cloud to the next, to the next, to the next. And um, the capacity of the cuboid that you use is important to tax uh, the algorithm. So setting it too low, which is the red line over here, too slow. Setting it to be infinity, too slow. Um, something around uh, 1,500 or 1,000 points or FLSS per cuboid does a good job of letting this algorithm uh, ex execute. But still, its execution time is around 100 seconds. You can take this algorithm and you can parallelize it because we have these cuboids and the cuboids are fixed across the sequence. So potentially you could use thousands of cores where each core takes a cuboid across the different point clouds and computes the flight path for those FLSs within that cuboid. At the end of the day, um, this algorithm is resource intensive. Uh, so it's going to require execution time in the order of seconds and it's going to use a lot of uh, computational resources. So if this point cloud is uh, this motion illumination is displayed over and over again, it makes sense to store the flight paths in a file. And then you can read the file every time instead of executing this expensive algorithm each time. So uh, we've done that. We have uh, a paper that describes how to store the FLS flight paths inside of files for subsequent recall and uh, presentation. Something that's very interesting here is computing flight paths results in compression of data. It may sound counterintuitive, but if I have a point and it's not moving from <coughs> one point cloud to the next, there is no point <coughs> in having a flight path for it. Uh, having, uh, you know, how many ever 115 point uh, mesh files, that information is repeated. But then if we compute the flight paths, there is deduplication of information and the representation becomes extremely compact. Some like a factor of 100 compression uh, compared to the information. So today's model uh, takes the output of something like Blender or Maya, which is a 3D authoring tool and uh, it generates point clouds first. And then subsequently, it takes the point clouds and computes the FLS flight paths. This algorithm today is uh, very resource intensive. And uh, it's also the case that the display on the DD is not real time. So you know, generating the point clouds is a point of separation from the authoring. So we are working on the next generation of this algorithm where it's tightly integrated into the 3D authoring tool. So imagine Blender being able to generate the flight paths for the FLSS as it's up. And then similarly, at the end of the day, this is a display. So there's no reason why the graphic artist cannot manipulate the 3D illumination and have it reflect back in the authoring tool. So if they're not happy with the shape, maybe they can rechange, uh, you know, change the shape. And by changing the shape, have that go back and be reflected uh, in the auto itself, the change appear in the auto. And question, how uh, likely is it to have <laughs> transparent draw FLS? <clears throat> Uh, in the future, because if we have transparent FLS, we can populate the entire display volume with each FLS, and then uh, this, this flight enough. path uh, becomes irrelevant. irrelevant. Because you just have to change the color. That's it. For I, each. I will not. <laughs> that would be awesome. 
that would be cool. So if that can happen, that would be just nice. It would simplify the design of that drone vision scheme. But then they also they will always have to go to charge and come back. That part that's different. different. That's different. And, and also, we can use laser or we'll use some other technology for the charge. But let's go on. There, there are many cool ideas that one can imagine here. But essentially, there are today, as we speak, there are applications that are generating 3D data. So I hinted at Blender and Maya as 3D authoring tools. But it's true that MRI scanners are also gen generating 3D data. And uh, if we had one of these drone visions, then we could potentially have those devices feed directly into this 3D display. What's happening today is that there's a flattening of the 3D data. They flatten that 3D data so that they can display that to two dimensional screens. So uh, if you had that 3D display, suddenly all the metadata that's gathered by the uh, authoring tools and that MRI scanner will be available in the form of information and knowledge that will be accessible to the user. And using the drone vision, the user can perhaps use a large language model in order to pose queries against that data, information, and knowledge in order to have the relevant information come back. See how I tied it together this time. <laughs> so uh, anyway, um, the, it's also the case that the reverse would also apply. So once you have the 3D display, it's the case that the user may start to add their own data information and knowledge, for example, to contribute additional information to that repository uh, for future projects. All right, let me show you a couple of demos. So uh, we've been uh, working on building a prototype and we are working with crazy flights. So we can take a fixed number of them and form a shape and have them fly in that formation. Over here, these uh, crazy flies are flying at a rate of one meter per second. They can fly much faster. If they fly much faster, the formation falls apart. And that's because of the downrush. So uh, the speed has been reduced in order to accommodate for the uh, downrush that is there. So, we can do different shapes, we can do vertical. <coughs> you get the idea. Uh, again, the speed is slightly higher here. Um, but <coughs> we are controlling it in order to maintain the formation. If you try to fly it at faster speeds, some of the drones go unstable and they just fly around in different directions. The fastest speed that we can realize, uh, and that's not even the maximum speed, is with the horizontal alignment. Even with the horizontal alignment, there is some downwash. So if you try to fly too fast, uh, it may fall out of the downwash. I hope that has answered your question, Sean. So we are also working with haptic interactions. So this is a paper that's going to appear in Long Beach at IEEE Haptics Symposium. And uh, essentially they're coming up with design of cages and the use of Wicon and Blodeck uh, to be able to ha have haptic interactions with the user. <laughs> so uh, Wicon uh, is more reliable. It's a centralized localization technique when it comes yeah. to flow deck, and it's a lot more stable, uh, but at the same time, it's rich. So these crazy flies are very small, and we've conducted human subject studies, unlike the approved subject studies. And uh, even though they're small, the users can feel the stiffness that's being generated by these crazy flies.
So that's Hamed, he's a PhD student. And uh, we're going to see him a lot in the video. The cameras that you see mounted at the back, that's the wire gun system. So the cameras are implementing the wire. Faces are blurred because these are actually subjects, human subjects uh, that we were asked to evaluate whether they can sense the stiffness that's being generated uh, by these faces. Yes. So are the rotors inside the cage? Because you can hurt yourself out of it, right? Exactly. So we designed that cage that's around it. And the design of the cage itself uh, is not trivial. Uh, the very first cage we designed had vibration. So uh, when the user would touch it and then this thing glides against it, it would just mm -hmm. hurt. Uh, it was just not working well. People would get confused with the stiffness. And what is this vibration? So we had to use special material for the cage uh, so that the vibration would be minimal uh, so that the user could focus on whether they can sense the stiffness. So many cool topics to work on. Isn't that great? New Year's, New Year resolutions, you know, <laughs> transparent preferences. Uh, but my list is huge. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, to be a great guy so that Santa Claus is good to me end of the year. And many of these are at risk, but user safety, acoustics is a huge deal. I don't know if you, you guys could hear the drone noise that was there. So how do you cancel out the drone noise is a huge topic. Uh, this 3D display would be nice to have 3D sound, wouldn't it? So 3D audio would be really cool. Uh, the design of the FLS is work in progress, modularity, I think, had big feedback. Uh, we have a lot of work to do on particularity cabinets, uh, and I'm super excited about it. We are starting to implement the localization techniques, collision avoidance. Yes, it's on our to-do list. Um, we just need to justify it. We must have the problem before we actually write the paper. Uh, the applications of the uh, failure handling, problem management, all of those are topics that we're looking at. And uh, that's the uh, GitHub repository if you want to access that source code. It's flying right specs. And before you guys run out, uh, there's a huge team working on this. NSF is sponsoring us. Uh, <coughs> the students are doing a fantastic job. And Heather is my collaborator. She is an assistant professor <coughs> in QS. So with that, I'll be glad to take your question. Thank you so much. So yeah, I think we do have time for a few questions. So uh, right now in the, the little, um, call it the little drones, the FLS, the, no, no, the one which you're seeing. Uh, the drone vision? Anyway, the, 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 yeah, light, the, the, la, the light is yeah. kind of having the same color, or it can do different red, green, and blue, right? Yeah, it has red, green, and blue. Yeah, yeah. Three 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 three. So, so that just mean, one, one kind of like red, yeah. green, or blue. Okay. No, no, okay. no, no okay. It, can, okay. it can actually combine them to present the spectrum, the yeah. full rich spectrum. Oh, okay. So that just like a normal display. Kind exactly. Of thing. It's like a normal yeah. pixel of your TV for your computers. Yeah. It's that yeah. like spectrum. Thanks. Seems like the presentation. You start out to do like nighttime in the sky, formations, yeah, formations, you know, sort of fire safe gender reveal. No, no, you're right. So they are wonderful night shows. The one that was done in Seattle for the New Year's celebration. And then there's one that was done in Chesham for celebration. They're yeah, just really helping what they're doing out there. Uh, and they have a lot of problems like what we do, we have. So for example, they're trying to have the light show on an area where there are more people being in. So they have, maybe you could argue that their challenges are more severe. They leverage on the GPS, so every drone is presentable, and that helps the optimization. But yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, something that's lacking during those the night shows is interactivity. Everything is pre-programmed. Don't stay in all 
they play and play and play and then they come and rest back. This business of having you to interact with them is insane. Right? So, so I was always wondering, which Khalifa, right? They normally display stuff. Is it drone based? Or is it like they have the lighting? Somehow they have got their other magic. Uh, uh, so it would be very cool to do this in a drone based way, right? So, yeah. I, I, uh, I've seen it, but I, I don't interact. Looks like there is a lot of uh, very good questions. Of course, for any students who are also interested in having some more questions, there's a uh, student time at 3 p.m. at this building at 2065, so feel free to join us. But uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much, Aram. It's a wonderful time. Student session, is it bring your own <laughs> There's no one there. You go there, I'll just wait till the actual lab meeting. Oh, yeah, you can get into your game. No, not <laughs> how are you? So that's not 